saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. Friends, we worship today, gathering to remember it is God who saves us and has promised to never leave nor forsake us. We give thanks for God reaching out to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who came to let us know there are no conditions to God's love. Our scripture reading is the Philippians 1, 21 through 30. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God... For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Please pray for me. I invite you to 
join me in prayer praying loving god we ask you to give us grace to deal with others as you have graciously dealt with us grant us grace to deal with ourselves as you have dealt with us you know we like to keep score as we set high standards we then punish ourselves and others when we or they won't meet those standards we confess keeping account of all the ways in which others have offended wronged or caused us pain we love to take full credit for our accomplishments we see them as signs of our achievement rather than gifts you and others have given us so loving god help us to be more gracious with each other and with ourselves open our eyes to see that all of us live through the generosity of your love rather than through our own efforts give us the grace we need to be more gracious we pray this prayer in the name of jesus christ our lord who taught us to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen The scripture reading for our sermon today is Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. This is a long reading. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. Well, when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. I share a sermon, a scheme of things different from my scheme of things. I'll never forget a young woman who came into a previous church between two weddings on a Saturday afternoon. She caught me as I was coming out of the sanctuary, making sure that all was in place for the second wedding. Can you help me, she asked. I have three pennies to my name. Well, we went into my office and she told me she had two small children. Her husband was disabled and she had just been laid off from her job. 
I know you have a food pantry, she told me. I wonder if I could get a few groceries. Well, we got her a couple of sacks of groceries and I gave her a food voucher to buy milk and some perishables at the grocery store. She asked about the weddings and told me that she'd gotten married by the justice of the peace because there was no money for a big church wedding. She then made this very telling comment. Life isn't very fair, is it, Reverend? You know, I had to agree with her. Life is very unfair. At first glance, our scripture reading is about unfairness. It's an outrageous story by Jesus about a boss's generosity toward his workers. But the story ends in grumbling. Why? Grace shown toward others doesn't feel all that good, does it? A God who does not play by our rules, our schemes, is a God who tends to keep us off balance, wondering in what new ways God will be gracious next. You see, the grace of God is not only amazing, but it's potentially exasperating. Scholar John Dominic Croson says, Jesus was crucified and caused trouble because he put forward an unbrokered kingdom where the front door was not controlled by the priests or religious regulations or ethnic entity or pious behavior. Rather, the door was thrown open by his embodiment of the gracious love of God. End quote. This morning's Bible story challenges our attitudes about fairness in life. The parable is about people going to work, some for eight hours in the heat of the day, some for three, some for only one hour. Then the master of the vineyard calls them together and pays everybody the same wage. The workers who've been lounging in the marketplace until 4 p.m. get paid as much as those who punched in at dawn. There's grumbling among those who've been sweating in the vines all day. And why not? Is this any way to run a business? They want to know, what kind of justice is this anyway? In this parable, we come face to face with another way of being in the world that is different than our accustomed ways. And the story is so Matthew. Other Gospels may be stuck on the love and gracious acceptance of God, but not Matthew. As far as Matthew is concerned, Jesus Christ brings us salvation. But that doesn't change one thing about the rules. They still apply. Matthew is filled with stern demands and lists of injunctions. The gavel comes down in the great court of the Almighty. Other Gospels may have stories about bad boys who come back home after weeks of carousing in the family car with Dad's credit cards. Even with his terrible hangover, the old man welcomes the prodigal with open arms and orders a banquet thrown in honor of his homecoming. Not Matthew. He tells stories of foolish virgins standing in the darkness, clawing at the door. But they had their chance. The door is now shut. Too bad for them. Matthew's fond of little moralistic lessons like the one about a poor servant who tried to chip his fellow servants out of a few dollars. When the master found out about his scheme, he had him beaten and thrown into jail forever and a day. For Matthew, you see, you, you get what you deserve. When you make your bed, be prepared to lie in it. What you sow, you reap. Actions have consequences in this gospel. There's a cause and effect relationship between our ethics and our ultimate destiny. So be careful what you do, because in the end we will all be judged. The sheep will be separated from the goats, and we must all answer for our actions. Well, that's why we're here in worship, right? 
the preacher is to warn us to shape up our lives so we can mend our ways and get right with God. Do what Jesus says. Read your Bibles daily. Say a little prayer for good luck. Keep your nose clean. You'll do well and go to heaven. Popular religion, that is. But what does Jesus say? A man hired some workers. Some worked for him all day long. Some managed to get in a few hours after lunch. Others who got there late worked only one hour. At quitting time, all the workers got paid the same. As a result, there was grumbling, murmurings of injustice, righteous indignation, and envy. The employer asks, Do you begrudge my generosity? Or more literally, Is your eye evil because I'm good? We believe that if you cheat, the person you most hurt is yourself. But look around and see how those cheaters are better off than you and I are. We want to stand up and shout, wait, there's been a mistake here. Something's wrong with the system. A system where companies can import illegal immigrants, work them, use them, and then when there's a raid, they just go through the process again. How is it that politicians can lie and abuse the system and still get reelected? When you do lie, you're punished, right? The world's got an odd way of punishing cheaters and liars, doesn't it? It's not fair. On the whole, we're dependable, conscientious, hardworking, high achievers who've been laboring in the vineyard since early morning. We didn't get here by relying on someone else's goodwill. We've worked hard. We know if you fool around the whole semester and wait until the night before the exam to open the book, you're going to pay for it. That's the way it is. And no one should grumble about that. Sure, I flunked the course, but I had a great semester while doing it, says one. I got an A, but I worked for it, says another. And everything is as it should be. Tit for tat. Cause and effect. Labor for your wages, study for your grades. But we look around and we see those getting by and we wonder about it all. What if Jesus was right when he said, God makes rain to fall on the good and the bad and his sun to shine on the just and unjust? What if Paul really means that God is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish? Studs Terkel commented on the CBS Evening News that the typical American attitude is, I've got it made because I deserve it. If you don't have it made, then you don't deserve it. When things don't work out that way, as has been the case for lots of Americans these days, a kind of meanness sets in. Meanness and grumbling. Two men went into the church to pray. One was a money-grabbing, traitorous, idolatrous swindler of a tax collector. The other, a Bible-believing, tithing church attender. Two men left church, as Jesus tells it. The tax collector was justified, accepted, but not the regular church attender. A boy de demanded his inheritance from his father and, and left the father's house and blew it all on booze, loose living, and bad women. When he finally crawled back home in rags, his father threw a homecoming party. The belief that a little dose of religion, a little helping of the Bible would do us a lot of good must come to terms with the unexpected nature of religion we encounter in this parable. You see, the gospel resists our attempt to appropriate it to justify what we believe is fair and good. The Bible challenges our expectations of the way the world ought to work. In the Bible, there's some good help for daily living. But you know, there are also many stories where the first are last and the last are first. They shock us into the realization that our ways are not God's ways. 
This parable is not a story about how God helps those who help themselves. It's not a call to do good so good might be done to us. It's not a story of how employers are, ought not be limited by governmental regulations regarding fair treatment of employees. It's not about how we ought to feel kindly toward those prodigal sons and daughters who has somehow managed to slip through our system of ethical cause and effect and get saved. You see, Jesus does not make a moralistic point in the story. There is no suggestion of laziness or merit on the part of any of the workers. They're just people. Go to work early or late. There is no lesson for us to learn or put into practice to make the world a better place to live. God's gracious generosity, when it cuts through my little moral equations, creates not gratitude, but grumbling. When you receive grace, I grumble. When I receive it, I assume that I've earned it. Either way, grace is utterly beyond my human powers of, to comprehend it. It's always been a shocker. I think the lesson of this parable for us today is that God's ways make the world a rather surprising, sometimes confusing place in which to live. Jesus rams this parable into our self-satisfied, smug assumption that we have it all figured out. And if we don't like hearing such stories, maybe we shouldn't bother with Jesus. Here's a story of how God's grace is so surprising, so beyond our comprehension or appropriation, that it is absolutely exasperating. It's a story about a generous God and a grumbling humanity. It isn't easy to take. You know, I don't like to be thrown off balance. I like my world more predictable than that. Don't you? I want it to work work out my way, and yet it comforts me when I reflect on the national and world situation today that God is really in charge and I don't have to be. And God will do what God will do. We can trust that. Thanks be to God. When I was a district superintendent, I preached at a service in which about a dozen people, mostly adults, were being received into the membership of that congregation. We made our way through the liturgy, through the vows and words of welcome in the service. And then the pastor, looking at the new member, said, in case we have not been clear about this in our preparation for membership, let me be clear. You are being received into the congregation on the basis of the same membership standards which our Lord used for his own disciples. Are you sure that among you there are found liars, adulterers, thieves, gossips, misers, and rogues? If not, you need not apply here. For the Bible is clear that our Lord came only to seek and save the lost. He came only to call sinners to new life in his kingdom. That's who this church is for. Those are the ones for whom he died. Welcome to the church. And I thought, what a shining statement of the scandalous grace of God. Amen and amen. There's a whiteness in God's mercy like the whiteness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner and more graces for the good. There is mercy with a Savior. There is healing in His blood. For the love of God is broader than the measure.
treasure of our minds and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we should rest upon God's word and our lives would be illumined by the presence of our Lord. I invite you to hear please the benediction. And now may God bless you with confidence in living, hope in relationships, and joy in living your faith. But above all, may you know peace in the core of your being as evidence of your faith. Amen. Love.